So you're listening to the Food and Fitness Podcast, all things related to food and fitness. You can follow the show on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at food.fitnesspodcast. Today, we're your host, Dave Marshall, Jackie Vandertoon, and Jessica White. On today's episodes, we're joined by a local naturopathic doctor from Orangeville. We'll call her Dr. Danielle for today. You'll, uh, you'll see how passionate she is about her profession and why her patients are recommending their friends and family to go see her on a very regular basis. We're going to try and break down some of the walls between us and naturopathic medicine. So, Dr. Danielle, what does naturopathic medicine mean to you? And yeah, can you expand on maybe what people aren't used to when it comes to naturopathic medicine? Yeah, absolutely. I, I first want to say just thanks for this opportunity, guys. I'm really grateful to speak about, uh, well, my really my 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 life. I feel like I, I eat, sleep, and breathe this. Then, you know, when it comes to naturopathic medicine, from a deaf, like more of a definitive standpoint, you know, we uh, we can talk about things like uh, treating the root cause of disease versus uh, just you know naming a symptom and identifying a treatment, um, using the fundamental powers you know of nature to heal. So instead of using prescription medication, I delve more into diet and lifestyle, plant-based medicine. Um, a lot of people don't know that naturopaths in Ontario are also regulated in uh, Chinese medicine. So I do a lot of acupuncture as well. Um, you know, more personal to my own practice, I think naturopathic medicine for me means putting my patients into context. Um, so spending time with patients, uh, getting to know them outside of the concerns. So if they're constipated, I want to know more. What are you eating? What do you do for a job? What's your stress like? Are you sleeping? Right. So really getting to know the patient. Uh, and then the other key piece for me in terms of identifying naturopathic medicine is really in the management of the patient's health. Um, I just I really feel like I have being an ND in Ontario, I really have the ability to um, to really be a case manager and, and pull connect the dots right no one else is connecting dots but I have that I have the time and the resources to to do that yeah I personally love that I love that about naturopathic medicine in that uh, oftentimes you ask really obscure questions and I'm like what does this have to do with right. x and so I can kind of see the thought process of trying to make those connections Interestingly, if you ask any little kid what they want to do when they're growing up, they'll often say, I want to be a firefighter, I want to be an astronaut, I want to be a doctor. You know, what prompted you, and I'm not dating you, but I'm thinking that you're probably as similar to all of us in age. What prompted you? Did you grow up wanting to do this? Or what pathway did you take to become and study naturopathic medicine? Uh, yeah, and I think you know, my parents will attest to the fact that they, right from, you know, the time I was quite young, I always wanted to be a doctor. I kind of have this fascination with human anatomy specifically. Plant biology, I could leave, um, but human anatomy, I am thrilled. Like I, and I just, I couldn't get enough information growing up. Um, so I always knew I wanted to be a doctor. Um, I think uh, as I was getting closer and closer, so through my undergrad, preparing for, you know, things like MCAT and, you know, to get into an Ontario medical school is insanely difficult, but I never even ended up applying, mostly because I, I figured out within the halfway through my undergrad that spending it, and it was just, I remember speaking to my family doctor about it, you know, like how much time do you have with patients? And, 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 you know, I also had issues kind of um, as a teen and young adult that required some frequent visits. And I, and I just, there was, you know, one doctor would say one thing, another one would say, don't do that, do this. And no one was talking. And I remember thinking like, how fulfilling, like at the end of your day, how fulfilled are you? And she said, well, you know, it's sometimes it's about money, right? More than it is about connection. And I was like, oh, you know, that's not why I was doing it. I also love the piece about like the investigation, like connecting the dots, going beyond the symptom and looking at root cause. Like I just, and you know, of course, I'll never forget the conversation with my parents where I'm like, well, I, I think I want to be an ND. And, you know, I remember my dad furiously, like, uh, what, what is like, what, what do you mean? What does that mean? And I explained like, well, the education is very similar. So, you know, buckle up because I'm going to need your help for another good four years. Um, uh, but yeah, it meant, you know, it didn't mean, you know, graduating and having a guaranteed income, right? Like I'm self-employed. I got to, I had to work my butt off to build my practice, which, um, 
I'm happy to do it. You know, and I love that aspect of it as well. Um, but yeah, that conversation was funny. Uh, anyways, now, you know, I'm, they're thrilled. I did it. Uh, I'm obviously thrilled. I did it. Uh, because I like, you know, my husband's super jealous that I wake up like, okay, let's go to work. Right. <laughs> He's like, Oh God, please. I don't want to go to work. So I, I, yeah, I'm, I feel very blessed and, uh, very lucky to have gotten to this part, to this point. And I just ask you, did you have a natural path that influenced you or you stumbled across the profession when you were doing your undergrad? Uh, I stumbled across the profession when I was doing my undergrad. I did have a really, uh, one of my really good friends in undergrad, um, her aunt is a really well-known ND um, in uh, Toronto. So I was able to get a little bit more familiar with her practice. Um, uh, and then I was able to attend the, my naturopathic college has a, has a, clinic, an internship clinic right within there. And I was able to get in there and I was still somewhat dealing with the issues that I had uh, uh, in my early twenties. And I like, you know, your first appointment there is an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like for the first time, someone was listening to me, right? Someone was hearing me. Oh, it gives me goosebumps. Um, and then it, that was it. That was it. Right. Like I knew done. It was done. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting. And I, you know, it's always nice to know why people pick the path. So the next question that we have, that I have is, it's somewhat tied to the first question, but it's more just in general. Um, do you remember why you chose the medical field? Like why that was the path that you wanted to choose to go to school? Yeah. I mean, right from the get-go was just like to be, and well, yeah. And I think that one of the more discerning factors around the medical field, and, you know, like I said, human anatomy to sit in that all day long. That's just what I wanted to do. But then another discerning factor that pulled me towards the naturopathic side that I haven't mentioned is just the education piece, right? So I don't, I, I don't, I choose not to take the knowledge I'm sharing for granted and assume that when I make, when I'm saying, okay, so you have this, you have X, I want you to do this in your lifestyle. I want you to eat this in your diet. I want you to take this as a supplement and here's why. Right. I don't I don't just assume that they're going to treat me as the authority. And I so explaining the pathology, connecting the dots and explaining why one plus two plus three equals six. <laughs> My brother's a math teacher and not me. Um, uh, yeah, that it was it was just uh, such an important piece. And I know like MDs, they just don't they're working in a system that doesn't give them time to do that. Right, we're expecting more of MDs than than is fair, really, at this point. But yeah, yeah. So more full picture and very explained. Yes, yes. Like it's so empowering, right? If I want a patient to make a massive change, they gotta know why they're doing it, right? Hmm. Otherwise, you know, they're kind of like, well, I guess I have to. I guess I can't eat gluten. I don't know. And if they need to know why, right? Because that's a massive change. And my my treatment plans usually are quite involved, right? I need the patient to work for, I need them to put the work in and build the insight. And if I don't have them engaged, what, why would they do it? Right. Yeah. And it's actually something I can attest by because um, I am one of your patients. Uh, other listeners may not know that, but uh, that's what I found was so fascinating because I kind of did walk in with of perception of maybe what a naturopathic doctor would be. And I think we had a good laugh at that conversation, um, which was great. Um, but I kind of thought it would be maybe a little bit more hippie-ish and kind of thing. But I, I truly appreciate the time that you spent listening, working through stuff. And when you put a plan down, when you were going through that plan, you discussed, this is why we're going to do this. And this is why we're going to do this. And when you said you're going to take alcohol and chocolate off the table my next question was what you're gonna ruin sex for me too like come on <laughs> um yeah but um but when you but when you take the time to explain things those things to a patient and you understand where the patient is coming from as well it's a lot easier for um uh, for someone like myself to go through that um and i really appreciate and respected you a lot more for it so with my perception that I walked in, what are a lot of perceptions that you have to battle with uh, when you have someone new coming into your office? Yeah, and I mean, this is an excellent question because I really do feel that that naturopathic medicine, um, while it came under, while we had regulation changes in 2015 that really helped 
open up our scope of practice, I feel like all of a sudden we saw, I, it's becoming more prevalent. There's a divide happening within my, my profession, um, uh, whereby uh, I find some NDs deserve the bad reputation that, that we get. So for example, selling too many supplements, running super expensive tests that aren't uh, uh, supported by evidence, um, uh, giving diagnoses that are, that are not medical, right? So candida, right? Um, uh, adrenal, you know, using terms like adrenal fatigue, these are not diagnostic. These are not evidence-based. And my curriculum, I mean, we also have like our elders of the profession, right? So, and these people, I just, you know, these are, their education vastly different from mine. It was very eclectic in nature. It was very historical, um, very plant-based, which is fine. I mean, there's tons of magic there. I shouldn't use the word magic. There's tons of evidence in, listen to me, you see how easy it is to slip into that. Um, uh, but even now with current grads, um, uh, I can really, I can see it and I can feel it. And, you know, I see patients come in all the time. And one of the first things I'll say is, have you seen a naturopath before? And how was that experience? I want to know where they're coming from. Right. I want to know, uh, well, it didn't work out because I spent all this money and I, on, on supplements and I didn't get better. Uh, there was lack of follow-up, um, uh, my doctor thought they were crazy or what, like whatever. Right. Um, and even now I have, I had a conversation amongst uh, local naturopaths um, uh, who were running tests they should that aren't within our Ontario laboratory act that I never, I mean, I'm in the clear because I would never run that test because it's a huge amount of money and it still doesn't tell us what we should be, what we should be learning to, to treat effectively and diagnostically, right? Um, uh, so I can only speak for my own practice, right? I used to, you know, I remember my cousin when I was still in school was like, so how's witch doctor school? My back went up and I'm, naturopaths aren't witch doctors, were amazing. I've changed my script now, right? I only talk about my approach. I am the only one in control of my practice and I, I no longer speak about naturopathic doctors in general. And I make it very clear that my approach is not the same across the board. I think while we have very strict competency exams, we're not under an OHIP thumb. So we can choose to approach practice a little bit differently. Um, uh, I know there are still, oh, you know, there's always going in any profession, there's always going to be someone that's doing something that, that just drives you crazy and, and gives, gives your profession a bad name. So I've, I've just sort of chosen to remove myself from that dialogue and just speak for, for myself and my own practice. Um, uh, and, you know, David, as you said, uh, barriers are just, I, I get skeptics, right, coming in. Um, it's often not the patient, it's often <clears throat> a parent, a partner, a, a sibling of a patient who's like, oh, what are you doing that? stuff for right so then it kind of makes your job harder because now you have to explain yourself through a patient to someone else sure. you're not the one having that conversation with them right absolutely and i i mean i'm, I'm okay with that I'm, I'm kind of of an attitude now i mean it used to really you know i feel like i was getting ahead and then i hear something and it would pull me back now it's more of like a bring them in right let's, they can call me tell them to call me and i also let my patient's experience speak for itself Right. If it's someone who loves them enough, who who is who has enough authority in their world to give their opinion on a naturopath, um, I just I just say, you know, give me time, give you and me time, right? But your experience and how you feel is gonna just speak for itself. And know that I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna tell them, although I tell them, I'm like, go home and tell them that I thought your my third eye said that your spirit animal is a unicorn. And because of that, I want you to eat hay. Say it with a serious face. <laughs> that is so funny. Thank yeah. you. You've actually said a word. I, I lost count. I think it was four or five times that made my heart sing. And I teach at a university and I teach research and I'm okay. a skeptic and I ask questions all the time. Yes. In fact, my lecture last week was on evidence-informed practice and the importance <sighs> of it. And you've made my heart sing because you said evidence 
at least five times. Yep. And one of the reasons that I've always been a skeptic, I think skepticism is important in anything Absolutely. that you do. Yep. But one of the reasons I'm a skeptic is because I see these broad-based diagnoses, like I suffer from candida. Yes. And I, you know, suffer from, I'm quoting you, adrenal fatigue, which when I would look it up for evidence, I couldn't find anything. So I'm like, mm, well, okay. Yeah. So can you share with me how you stay on top of evidence as a naturopathic practitioner and how you share that evidence and myth busting with your patients? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the first thing I'll always do um, is I'll explain the definition of evidence-based medicine. Okay. Especially when I know if I have a skeptic in front of me, or I have someone who has an MD who is, who is against natural, you, you know, what are you wasting your money? Whatever. So I'll always explain the definition because it, it's, it's three, it's, it's got three fundamental concepts, right? So the first thing, when you're talking about evidence-based approaches, there's gotta be some research, some published credible research to back up the treatment, right? I have to have some clinical, I, I need to either have personal or know of clinical experience because research could say one thing, but if it doesn't happen in real life, right? Then that's kind of a strike against the evidence-based approach. But the third aspect of evidence-based medicine, which is not part of our OHIP approach to medicine, largely it's a time thing, um, is patient's value. Mm -hmm. That's huge. So, a, so I could have all the research in the world. I could have a hundred case reports I could throw at that patient, but if there's something about that treatment that they don't resonate with, or they don't feel right about, then I'm, and I, and I, and I dismiss that I'm no longer practicing evidence-based medicine, or if I don't ask them how they feel about that, because that's also not a conversation that happens in an MD's office, right? You have migraines, here's a pill, a triptan medication, for example, um, take at first onset and off you go. Never is there, are you okay with this? Mm -hmm. Does this fit into your, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'll always explain that because also part of my role is empowering, right? Um, uh, getting patients to understand that they really do know their bodies best, that, that I'm just, I'm just going to, I'm a helper, <laughs> right? I'm a helper. I'll, I'll give some suggestions. Um, uh, in terms of, you know, keeping myself on top of current research, like how, how cool is that I'm in a profession that is constantly evolving? Like, right? I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't know, um, hammering a piece of wood into every, the same thing every single day. I am so blessed that it is constantly evolving, as are my treatments. I'm in my 13th year of practice. So I have patients that I've been seeing for 13 years and they've been on the ride with me, right? For certain conditions, okay, stop this because now we know better. How, mm -hmm. how cool, we now know better, right? I do find this is, this is something I often, in my MD letters where I say, sometimes I'll say, you know, we now know better. And if we know better, we have to do better by our patients. Um, uh, as an ND in Ontario, we have continuing ed credits that we have to get every year. I actually just had to report mine. And I like I could cut, I cut them in half because I had overdone it like I do every year, much to my husband's dismay. Um, but I'm a reader. I'm also a reader, right? I got my stack of books on my bedside that I, I can't, I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm doing what I should be doing. Let's just say that. Like I am in it to, to win it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So you, how important is it in working in concert with their, their family physician? Um, and why is that important for their, your patients to know that you work hand in hand with them, not against them? Yeah. Um, awesome question. It, it, the whole con, like I'm, I'm a goosebump person. So you just gave me goosebumps again. Uh, I, and I do typically tell almost every new patient that walks in the door that I, or I also do these meet and greets where, where, um, we just spend 15 minutes kind of getting to know each other. And I'll, and I'll say to the patient, I, I, it is an integrative approach, right? So naturopaths are known as an alternative practitioner. And I hate it. I hate it. Because you're insinuating that it's either or you either listen to your MD or you, li you listen to your ND. That doesn't serve anybody, right? So I make it very clear to my patients that I am a part of their healthcare team. I am not the only one. 
you do not come to me if you're having chest pains, right? That is an MD job, right? Um, my practice is also limited in scope. So I can't check, I can't do x-rays. I can't run ultrasounds. I don't have access to all the prescriptions. Um, uh, and there are many times a day that that's also needed, right? Mm -hmm. um, if we can, and I get like, you know, a lot of patients say, why doesn't OHIP just cover you guys? Well, one reason is if they did it, if they, we woke up tomorrow morning and they said, NDs are now part of OHIP, there's not enough of us. There's not enough of us, right? Everyone will get angry. But how grand would that be? If you think, you know, you're, you're, you've got your MD and I say this all the time and I still, it's still, I'm so, MDs keep us alive. Mm -hmm. NDs keep us well. I love it. Right. And MDs do a great job. I am not, I think a lot of patients too, another stigma is that I'm anti-prescription or I'm anti-MDs, right? I, I'm not at all. I love my, I love my family doctor. I'm not like, I got a, I, I actually, this is another thing that drives my husband crazy. If my kids are like, I don't feel good. I'm like, call the doctor. He's like, you are a doctor. I'm like, not that kind. Quick, call the MD. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, I, I, there's a place, there's a place for both of us. And if we work synergistically, we will be laughing, laughing. The part that kills me, I'm not accessible to everyone. Right. It's the part that kills me. Yeah. Now, you did mention, um, like if OHIP were to cover there, you know, there wouldn't be enough um, naturopathic doctors to fill. Yep. How many, how many NDs are entering the field annually do you think like how many schools are there that are fielding doctors because yeah. you, you know you you see all the time like class of x amount of like doctors times x amount of schools and all these people are have, going to have to enter the the field yeah which are you know mds but how many naturopathic doctors would you say are entering or how many schools are fielding classes yeah so there's only two accredited schools in canada there's one in toronto which is the one i went to and one in bc um, average size of class, my class size was 109 and that was back in 2008. Uh, I believe a more average class sizes now are upwards of 150. I think the, I think the ish and the devastating part for me is, uh, the number of NDs who don't make it so that they, they graduate, they, yeah. they, they pass their competency exam and then end up doing something else because they can't make a living um, you know, there is some critique around my school and, and not being able to weed out like there should I sometimes I feel like it's more or there should you know we need a guidance counselor in there right because there's people who are not who are and you can like you are not meant at, at a level of connection that naturopathic medicine requires. There are people there who should not be dealing one on one with patients mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. research 100% right? Working for a supplement company, developing products, a hundred percent. But given what's required of the profession, they just shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't, you need a guidance counselor and they're going, let's look at your options. Right. And it's just, it's not happening. So the, the colleges can, and I believe Boucher, uh, the, the school in BC is very similar. So you're looking at, say you're pumping out 300 new NDs a year for across Canada. That's not enough. Not and enough. I guess you're not just like the doctor. You're also kind of trying to do your own marketing and all this kind of stuff, because as an entrepreneur, you don't have a line or, you know, if you, have, you don't have a lineup of patients that are looking for doctors who are just calling off, say, I'll take a doctor whenever they can have them kind of thing. Yes. Right. Yes. You got, yeah. And you got to prove yourself. Right. I don't, I don't have the MD title next to my name that comes with that authority. Right. I have the ND that probably comes with more stigma than it does authority. So I've had to just, and I'm like, I'm okay with it, but I got to prove myself. And I'm like, I'm mm -hmm. okay. I've got 13 years under my belt that I know, you know, stick with me, kid. Like we got this, but yeah. those first few years were, were so trying, so trying. Mm. Yeah. It's tough. So do you find that? When, on someone's wellness journey, when they do come to you, um, at that point that they are in your office, are they there because they've tried everything else 
and they're there for like their last, you're their last hope and their last resort? Or do they come to mm-hmm. you um, to kind of help supplement more information from their MD? Like, Yeah, I would say working in a small town, I'm more often a last resort. And, and I tell patients like, I'm, I'm okay with that. Like, mm-hmm. I, that's okay. Because at this point, now, if I'm a last resort, that means they've got all the testing in front of me right? So it's quicker. It's just, we got less work in front of us, right? Um, uh, Some, I do have some GPs in the area who will take the more higher maintenance patients and say, you know what, go go see Dr. Danielle, which is, but these are people who are just screaming to be heard and just need the management piece, right? That MDs, some MDs in town can recognize they just don't have the time to do that that they're working within a framework that doesn't have flexibility, whereas I do, right? So I would say most, yeah, mostly it's last resort, but I do, like I said, I can get patients coming in. Uh, I, and at this point, I also have enough patients who, who usually bounce things off me first, right? I had three, my first three this morning were all like, I'm coming here first before my MD, but we've, we've known each other now for, you know, five plus years. So they know what to expect. They know that. And then the other piece too, like sometimes all I'm doing is giving them a path. That's mm-hmm. all I'm doing. Right. So, well, I've got, um, uh, upper abdominal pain and it's new and it's unrelenting and I don't know what to do. So, you know, I'll do an assessment and, and make sure there's like not obvious any like obstruction or, or anything. Um, but then it's like, okay, here's what we need to do. I need you to go back to your MD. We need, and sometimes I'll script it if I have to, depending on the MD. Other times let's say, tell them I, I assessed you. We need an abdominal ultrasound. We need a blood, you know, we need to check you for H. pylori, for example. Um, and we'll go from there. But they just, they just need to know what to ask for. Mm-hmm. And they also need to be validated because mm-hmm. some of these people have been dismissed, right? And they right. want to know if it's, is it worth, because I'll be honest, right? I got, you know, yeah, yeah. There's some patients who I don't, I won't, get, they're looking for something specific and clinically it's not there, mm-hmm. right? So sometimes it's also, yeah, I don't just give it two days. It'll go away, right? Mm-hmm. But they just need, they, some patients just need to know that. So it just, it just depends on how long I've known them, what their family doctor is like, like what the relationship is like. Um, mm-hmm. uh, we go from there. That's awesome. So when people do come to you uh, as a last resort or their validation, what are some of the most common things that people are entering your office with? Like some of those common questions. Uh, questions or like in terms of what their issue is, you mean? Yeah. So yeah, or like what their issue would be, but like what are some of the most common questions that people are asking you? Like, can you help me with this? Oh, like certain, whatever issues. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I treat a lot of uh, digestive stuff. So people who have uh, IBS being a big one. Um, skin conditions like eczema, psoriasis, uh, low energy or fatigue is another one because, you know, on blood work, they look great. Uh, and the doctor's going, I don't know, get outside more. Uh, mental health. I see a lot of women's health, whether it's menopause or uh, menstrual issues. And then of course, I think because I have five kids, I do see a lot of pediatric and you know, my kids were my guinea pigs. They don't know that. They don't, someday they will, but they don't know. Uh, but yeah, I, uh, I do a lot of pediatric as well. And you know, Orangeville, small town, it's a general practice, right? I've got, I take care of women preconception, uh, to pregnancy, to postpartum, and then the baby becomes a patient of mine, right? And then uh, men are usually the last to come in, no offense, David, but it's just, I don't know, it's just the way it is, right? Um, when things men get- can be stubborn. I've never heard of that, but it's true. <laughs> well, you've heard. Yeah, uh, rumors. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. But uh, yeah, I have patients from, like I said, from Oh, we lost her. Yep, she's frozen. It is downpouring at my house. I'm going to close my window. It is here too. I just heard it. Oh yeah, you're all, you can hear me still? Yeah, yeah we, lost you back. we lost you for a couple seconds there. Oh, okay. I think, yeah, I can hear stuff going on outside. Yeah, it's, it's pouring here. I'm up in Shelburne, but we're all good. Yeah. 
we, we can continue. I'll just like crop that a little bit and then we, we can uh, piece yeah. everything together. So Dr. Danielle, I actually uh, have a drink in honor of you. And I have recently as a skeptic gone to see a naturopath. And okay. interestingly, I went to the naturopath for a last ditch resort. Um, and the listeners know, and these guys know, I have a chronic Achilles tendinopathy yeah. and uh, I have been seeing somebody for a while and I run. And so I was to the point where one of the therapists had said, you know, what? why don't you see a naturopath and see about treating from the inside? So give you some context. I've had this since 2010. It's been a long haul. Yeah. And um, so I was like, yeah, whatever. Like she'll probably just tell me to eat healthy. And, you know, we've discussed in this podcast, I have an okay diet. So up your fruits and vegetables. All right. That's what she's going to tell me. Yeah. She gave me a supplement called curcumin. Yeah. And, um, I can't tell you how that has changed my life, mm -hmm. like changed my life oh. and being the skeptic I was, I was so impressed with her holistic approach and looking at everything and narrowing it down. And, and, you know, I had told her the last time I saw her, I said, why didn't someone tell me this 10 years ago? I have been hobbling around and running races and through pain uh, for 10 years. And I just want it to stop. How can people, like I have two part question. One, if you were to say, and I know this is gonna be a tough question. If you were to say to people, um, one thing you can do in your lifestyle to change would be X. The second thing that I have a question about is how do we get people to adopt, um, and, and I'm going to say alternative, and I appreciate the fact that you hate that word, alternative ways of looking at management of the health instead mm -hmm. of resorting to anti-inflammatories for me in particular with my Achilles issue. Sure. Um, I think in, in terms of your first question with kind of that that blanket statement, I think, um, uh, in terms of start starting somewhere, I mean, there's a lot of thoughts come to mind. Things like what's common is not normal. Right. So if you sit and think of that, of all the things, if I, like I'm 42, if I think of all the times I've been told, yeah, that that's common. So don't, don't worry about it. Right. My Achilles is due to you're 50, get used to it. And you're a runner. And I'm a runner. So yeah. deal with it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's, that's not, that's not good enough. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, the other thing, start asking yourself to the, we want to start asking the why and not the what, right. I want to know why I'm having this, not what painkiller to take. Right. Um, and then just, you know, prioritizing self, like we, you know, we got, we got one body here, right. Dig deep. I tell patients, come on, you got to dig. Cause I get patients who come in here kind of just sort of half-assing it. Right. Like, well, I'm here because my sister came and, and she's got food sensitivities and I want you to check me for food. Okay. Well, what's going on with your body? Nothing. Well, I'm not going to check you for food sensitivities. <laughs> but why, like, why would I do that? And, you know, and then, and then I start prompting them. I need you to dig a little bit deeper here. Right. I need you to like, you know, give me, cause you know, um, how often do you have bowel movements? They're, they're regular what's regular to you, right? Like, come on, like you, you know, start digging deep because once you, I mean, we're North America culture, so it's a go, go, go. It's everyone else, not, not ourselves. Um, uh, so just, you know, pausing, digging deep, prioritizing self and just asking for more. Um, and I think once you start asking for more, I mean, you've got to ask for more in the right room. That's the other thing I'll tell. I got patients all the time are sitting in front of me going, my MD is useless. No, the OHIP system is restrictive. There's a difference, right? Your MD is very useful. The, 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 the model they're working in is what's not serving you right now, mm -hmm. right? There's a difference. Um, uh, and I think, you know, for me, a large part is just, I, I like, especially when I first started practicing, you know, thinking of uh, how do I gain, how do I gauge business, right? And I mean, I can't, we looked at uh, social media, I did conferences about building content, listen, I'm saying it, Jess, I'm not going to do anyone, <laughs> but, uh, and, and I found my most, like the most important thing I could do was just with each patient that came in. You got it. Like I had to go above and beyond each patient. And as I did that, 
um, uh, it, it just catches on like wildfire, mm -hmm. right? So that's kind of how you support a holistic well-being is each patient, not let's do a splash on social media about this is what naturopathic medicine can do for you. You do one patient at a time. Is that I, 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 yes, I've got to stay present. I still, you know, social, you know, social media is uh, not something I prioritize. If I see something that I think is is funny and is really reflective of my practice, I'll grab it, but never do I go looking for it, mm -hmm. right? Because I really, I just want, like, I've got, I have colleagues who are booking off afternoons to do their social media calendar. So number one, I'm like, hire someone, right, Jess? Yep. <laughs> Do that. Um, <laughs> like, would you not serve your practice better? Like, you know, spending that time, do more research on that patient that's 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 refract, like, you know, who's not getting better, or you know what I mean? I just I learned very early on that I I couldn't get caught up in in what other colleagues are doing. Like, I have a colleague who pushes social media all the time, mm -hmm. and she's messaging me saying, like, I I've built it and no one's come. Hmm. right but she's so busy with the with the exterior of her practice and trying to fight the stigma all the time that I think she's maybe she's somewhat distracted in in her in her one-on because she's so busy you know what I mean so yeah I feel like I'm doing it a bit differently and I'm and I'm I'm okay with that because I feel at the end of my day I feel really good yeah. awesome Awesome. That's awesome. I love that you say that you're, you're focused, obviously prioritized and it is the client that you're there to help. So it's, you yeah. know, it's just amazing. So if someone is looking for a naturopathic doctor, uh, what are some of the questions that they should be asking in that first meeting mm. when they're on the look? And are you, um, I don't know, are you offended when people treat their first visit kind of like an interview or is what's your take on that kind of thing? Yeah, so I totally um, did that the first visit. Yeah, and I, 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 you did, and but I'm so cool. Like you, you're coming in there going, "Do I give you my health or not?" Right? Like go, like absolutely. You, it, you, you're feeling me out, right? Um, and I think it really depends. The other thing too, you know, with regards to your first question, what kinds of questions people ask? Um, I think it depends on what they're looking for, right? Because sometimes I'm not the right fit for them. Sometimes they want me to die. Like they're looking for a diagnosis of candida or they come in cause they've already Googled mm -hmm. and they fit something that's got a massive amount of symptoms. Like and we all have candida, right. <laughs> and they want treatment for it. And I, and I, and I, I'm disagreeing with their, you know, Google doctor diagnosis um, uh, or they come in looking for more um, homeopathic type support, homeopathy being one of our modalities. It's just not something I do a lot of. I'll, I'll pull it in here and there when I know it's going to like a surefire, it's going to work. Um, otherwise I don't, um, lack of evidence is often my default answer there. I just, it's just not a modality I resonate well with. So if they're coming in looking for a homeopathic remedy, I'm not, I'm not the right fit. And you can gauge pretty quickly, um, uh, you know, as much as they're interviewing me, I get a feeling, right? Like I get a, oh boy, you know, I, and, and sometimes I'm referring and I'll say, I think you're looking for something that isn't part of my specific scope of practice. So, but here I've got a name and I'll stop the, the appointment short. And, you know, I won't charge like, you know, I'll just say, this isn't going to work. And I need you. I want to make sure that you are getting what you, what you're looking for. And I'll refer to someone who I know, you know, an ND who does practice a lot of homeopathy, for example. Right. Um, or one who's going to sell a bunch of supplements and run a bunch of unnecessary tests. <laughs> so just because I don't know, uh, what's the biggest difference between naturopathic ideology and homeopathic? Mm. Great so, question. It is a good question. Homeopathy is an, is an energetic modality. Okay. Um, uh, it is, uh, hundreds of years old. Um, it uses the energy. So there's, it's based on like cures, like, I'm going to try to keep this brief. Um, uh, where if you give, and all the remedies are the energy of 
the actual stuff. So there's remedies for plants, minerals. Uh, there's a Coca-Cola remedy, animals, uh, diseases. They're called nosodes. So there's a, there's a homeopathic remedy for rabies. And the idea behind the homeopathic remedy is whatever it would actually call, I mean, loosely, whatever it would actually cause in real life is what you'd use to treat it with, is what you would use to treat. So there's a snake remedy, for example, okay? People who could benefit from a snake remedy don't like wearing turtlenecks, right? They're very jealous people. Oh, 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 look. Oh, I'm not jealous. I just hate turtlenecks. <laughs> I mean, I'm, so, maybe I'm jealous of people who can't wear triple necks. We'll see. <laughs> I don't think that's a snake remedy. Anyways, so does uh, does Reiki and that fall under that homeopathy? Reiki modality? falls under just an energetic modality. Okay, so right, so it's just sort of working on that energetic plane. Chinese medicine also works on an energetic plane. I do a lot of Chinese medicine, but there's a whole bunch of published research on that, right? Like I like, I, I can, I can do, I can jive with that. Right. Um, uh, so homeopathy is, is, is a tool in a naturopath's toolkit, whereas naturopathic medicine is a much more broader, uh, definition, right? It's more of a, a profession that has homeopathy as a modality. Mm. Very interesting. Yeah. It's great because yeah, I totally um, treated our first visit like it was an interview, but it's also something as a type one diabetic is I do that with everybody um, because I want to know what I'm going into um, kind of if we can work together, because I think that's the most important thing is a medical team, like everyone's part of the team, the patient, the physician, everyone needs to be there. And if you're not going to work together or someone wants to shine as the star, most of the times it's not going to work. And, you know, it's something that I really appreciate when I have been able to really focus and have a strong team, like dietitian, um, endocrinologist. I feel like my family physician is on board and you're on board. So, I mean, yeah, I, I take it pretty seriously. And I think a lot of people should, um, and not just walk in and be like, yeah, you sound good. I found you in the yellow pages. Let's work together. right? Right. So I appreciate that. And, um, because maybe I put you through the interview process, um, but other things, but what are some challenges that you face, uh, when you're working with a patient and maybe the challenges that you face when you are working with an MD? Yeah. Um, I find the most, the most challenges I have with patients are when they, they've already diagnosed themselves and, you know, cause I don't, I don't always agree. I would say that's the most challenging position for me to be in, um, uh, breaking it to them, that I don't think it's that and that, and then I give, I do, you know, in cases like, uh, candida and the adrenal stuff, I mean, there's, there's a few, but, um, that's a good example of an, I'll bring in evidence-based medicine and where I sit from a practice. That's, you know, I also, I also offer, like I said, these 15 minute, just free meet and greets where patients come in, they give me their concern. I give them my approach and they decide if that's something they want to move forward with. I have a very, I have an outspoken colleague who really disagrees with the meet and greets and his approach is that it cheapens our profession that uh, MDs don't get meet and greets, but I want my patients to like, to like me and I, and I want to like them. Um, uh, and that to just assume, I, I get what he's saying, but when you get locked in with an MD, you're, you're kind of stuck, right? And we're not paying, I mean, we are, don't give me in taxes, I get it, but you're not paying out of pocket to see the MD. And so we have to give more respect to our patients in that some of them are paying out of pocket and they should have a say in, in the rapport they've built with the, with the MD. Right. We don't get that say with our MDs. We don't, we just don't, we're not, the system doesn't allow it. So, uh, uh, the meet and greets really helpful. Um, what was the second, you know, second part of your question there? Uh, so like, what are the, maybe some of the challenges you face when, uh, talking with a patient's, um, MD? Yeah. Um, uh, MDs have caught on that I have scope to run blood work. (laughs) So previous to that, I was able to write letters and they would, I would give the clinical reasons for them um, uh, to run it. They would run it. Now it's like, yeah, yeah, I get it. Go ahead. You don't run it, which is coming out of patient's pockets, which is why we, you know, financially just try to get the MD to help out here. Um, uh, So one is them just 
not agree, not being cohesive in terms of helping me with a request. I do try to keep those to a minimum. So people who don't have benefits or who are financially strained, once patients recognize, once they are fully informed and know the cost of the blood work, a lot of them are just like, just run it. It's not worth the back and forth. Um, uh, you know, I am all about co-management. So I write a lot of letters and get no answer back. And that's okay. That's okay. I'm like, I'm, I'll, I will, I'm going to keep throwing information your way and, and that's okay. Um, I do have a few in town who uh, they'll call me a bit of mutual patient, will fax letters, will email. It, it is a really great uh, working relationship and the patients really benefit from that. Um, it's, I've worked really hard. I have worked, I have worked my ass off. Can I say that? 100%. Sure. <laughs> I have worked my ass off at building relationships with these MDs. I don't, you know, there's one particularly um, ticked me off with a response to a patient. It was fully dismissive. So I had to write a secondary letter and I had to write it eight times because the first one was like, listen up. Like it wasn't, it wasn't nice. So, no, can't, can't do that. And each letter got a little bit more professional, right? Um, uh, and then, and then the next thing out of his mouth was, okay, yeah, let's do it. Yes. So I just have to, I have to persevere and I have to advocate for my patients and I do it in a very professional, you're still the God manner. And then they're like, okay. And they also recognize, I'll say to patients, please tell your family doctor that you're seeing a naturopath and I will not judge you for being on prescriptions, touching your prescription medication, right? Please tell them that I am not that ND, right? That's not me. Mm -hmm. And, and that seems to help. That seems to help. So, yeah. That's awesome. I think I kind of know the answer to this question from just listening to you. I'm going to give you a magic wand or, um, and, and no holds barred, there's no hip, oh hip, there's no money issues, there's no nothing. What would you like to see the future of, I'm gonna call it medicine, wellness, caring for people. What would you love to see? Can you see the goosebumps? You got me again, got me. Um, uh, I, want, I want everyone to have access to um, all forms of healthcare. I don't want it to be so hard. If you are having uh, menopausal issues that are, that are uh, you know, insanely affecting your quality of life, I don't, you shouldn't have to go and convince the MD to see a gynecologist, right? I want, what is my issue? Who do I have to see, right? And then, you know, the, the other aspect of that is um, dropping out and I'm going to use the word ignorant in its most truest form, right? So lack of, of information around something. I want, I want, if, if, if your role is to manage someone's health care, you better know every single role of everyone else around, right? I don't want, I've had MDs say about NDs, uh, what, they just did a weekend course. What? I had more classroom hours a week because, of course, of course, we compared. We compared Western's Medi Western and Max Medical School um, classroom hours to ours. We had more anatomy hours. We don't even do surgery, mm. right? So they like we. I was in class fifty-five hours a week. Like it was not a weekend course for four years, right? So I just I need that. I, I want to drop out the referral system. I want. I want full, I, I want part of medical school and part of naturopathic school to fully understand the two different systems. And I want everyone to have access to everyone. Right? Yeah. That's kind of what I thought that you were going with this. Good. Good. So with information flying around, new ideas, how do you keep up to date with what is going on and grow as a physician? Ooh, you should see my inbox. It's not pretty. I currently have, oh God, is this bad? Oh God. I don't even know if I should say this. I have 37,000 emails in my inbox right now. Uh, oh my gosh. But you know why? This is this oh, 37,000 un, 37, unread or 37,000 total? 37,000 total, not unread. Okay. Oh, also, I get a lot of patient emails and to maintain, I got to keep them. 
I don't actually have, I, I, I don't, I keep them in two places. Listen, okay. Anyways, uh, so <laughs> I, subscribe, I subscribe to a, to a resource, an online resource where I can get email alerts for when new studies come up on topics I'm interested in. So that's where I'm getting the ding, ding, ding. But I love, like, I am, I am on my email. Like everyone's like, oh, you're always on your phone. I'm like, no, check out. Like I am, but I'm like, I am like, learning like I, this is crazy stuff right like the stuff that's just constantly coming up it's a little overwhelming I think my brain at this point is starting to shuffle stuff out as new things come in but um uh so yeah just staying up to date on research um uh my con the continuing ed um industry for naturopathic medicine is awesome it's one thing I can say they they do a really good job of of offering enough different genres to really speak to the practitioner. So uh, I'm doing one of those often. Uh, and then just speaking, staying connected with friends and colleagues. And that's where my book list gets out of control. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's awesome. Awesome. That's awesome. Yeah we've kind of just had a little crash course on naturopathic medicine and who you are. And I mean, this, it's very condensed and you've shortened it up and been very good with us. So I thank you for that. Um, but before we go, I, I think we may um, have you back if uh, you're willing uh, in a future episode and definitely dive into some other things that maybe uh, we can help people with or uh, the right questions to ask or how to approach uh, their total health, uh, which I think would be, great down the road and uh you know continuing series or see what happens but we'll well i think we'll also probably link some of your books that you're going to recommend we'll talk about that off the air and uh you know maybe some things that people can read or learn and research on their own uh, but before we go what is a great thing that you could tell people now who are listening um a great first step that they can take or how to access more knowledge when it comes to their total health? Yeah, I think, I think you just got to start by, by you've got to have a spark ignited to want more, right. To, um, uh, uh, to just, to not be okay with the symptom treatment. I mean, don't, there are times that that's needed many times I needed where we got to buy time for me to work this out. So in the meantime, take this so that whatever is under control while we work in the back so that we can get rid of it completely. Right. Um, uh, but yeah, just to, again, it's that dig deep piece, right? Dig deep. And, and, and again, I, you know, I tell patients, we got, we got one go at this, right? So let's do it. And, you know, the other thing I'm telling patients too, things like, you know, eat, like you had said, Jackie, to eat, you know, you got to eat fruits and veggies. My new thing is telling patients, I'm not, I'm not telling you to eat fruits and veggies because we all know they're good for you. I'm telling you to eat fruits and veggies so that you don't die. Right? Like you need, it's the potassium in the fruits and veggies that we need so that we don't die. Right? So Maybe that's the take home, eat your fruits and veggies. And it's not, you know, it's not the same old eat your fruits and veggies. I'm tired of hearing that. I just said that to my 14 year old, what'd you have for veggies today? So you're going to die. She was like, <laughs> but then he grabbed a cucumber, right? So like it, it's, so eat your fruits and veggies. Step one. Great. Honestly, I, I cannot thank you enough for the information that you've given us for uh, your excitement and your passion uh, for your career and uh, it's very evident that you love what you do and that you are passionate about your uh, position as well as the health uh, and the direction of your patients. So thank you very much for that. Uh, where can people find you if they are looking for uh, a naturopathic uh, doctor in the Orangeville Dufferin area or if they're looking for any information, stuff like that? Give yourself a shout out, shameless plug, go to it, go to town. <laughs> so I co-own an awesome clinic in Orangeville called Collective Health Clinic. I co-own with an osteopath. He talks funny. He's Australian, I think. Um, uh, you can find our website is uh, collectivehc.ca. That's the best place to start. You can also book online. Um, and with, you know, COVID has brought a lot of horrible things, of course. The one silver lining for me is that it's opened up my access 
um, in terms of virtual and online care. So previous to COVID, we were able to do online care, but it was in very specific circumstances. Now we can, I can, so I have patients who live all over. They have to be in the province of Ontario because I have to be, my license has to be active in the province. So anywhere in Ontario was able to now access my care, which is really great. Um, wow. Yeah, yeah, it's very cool. Um, uh, yeah, but the, the website is the best place to start. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you for watching and listening to this week's episode of the Food and Fitness Podcast. Join us next week when the hosts of the Food and Fitness Podcast sit down to reflect and talk about our personal experiences with naturopathic doctors.